why is it that disposability, this idea of only using something once, is the root cause of waste? Tom Zaki, CEO of TerraCycle, has noted that in the 1930s, everything came to consumers, from milk to motor oil to perfume, in a milkman model designed for reuse. Yet, less than 100 years later, we're now drowning in waste, from plastic packaging in our oceans to growing landfills. So what changed? For those of you joining us who might not be familiar with TerraCycle and its CEO, Tom Zaki, he's been thinking about this disposability problem and why there's waste and what we can do about it for a really long time. So Tom, after years working to eliminate recent concepts of waste and disposability, what have been some of your key learnings and, and what successes have arisen from recycling and reuse programs at TerraCycle and Loop? Gosh, it's a it's a it's a really great question. I think um, you know it is so important you know to honor what you said, which is our heritage as people is from a culture you know really since the beginning of of prizing things and making things and materials go around and around. I mean, back in you know till modern times, there wasn't really waste. You know, if something broke, you would reform it if it was a metal. Or there was this idea of you know we cobbled our shoes, we mended our clothes. You know, we really prized durability, quality, and things being timeless and living for a and also living for a long time. So what happened, right? 1950s come around and disposability is finally available commercially. And the world fell in love with it, still, by the way, in love with it uh, to this day. And I know we can vilify disposability, but the, we should honor it too, which it brought about you know, unparalleled convenience and affordability. I mean, that is the reason we still vote for it repeatedly today. And only recently have we really fundamentally, I mean, I think we may have known the problem of waste, but we've really sort of sunk into our hearts on mass, the crisis we're in probably two years ago. I'd say 2018 was the proverbial tipping point, and we sort of can't unsee what we've seen. You know, whether it was the turtle with a straw up its nose or Blue Planet 2 or whatever you was the moment for you, I think on mass we're there. And so now the question is, what do we do, right? So in recycling, I think what's important to really start with is what makes something recyclable? And, you know, many times people think that it's the technical ability to recycle something, right? So then we need a, a unique process to invent, to recycle things. And it turns out it's actually much simpler. It's all about whether garbage companies can make money. And what materials they can make money on is what we call recycling. And what they can't make money on is what we end up landfilling, incinerating, or, you know, getting rid of uh, without trying to get any value out of it. And so the way to unstick this uh, and recycle something that effectively makes no economic sense to recycle, which is effectively what makes it not recyclable, is to think about other ways to drive value outside the material value. So, for example, if a store, you know, maybe which has been even disproportionately like a physical store, disproportionately negatively impacted by, say, you know, a challenge like COVID and wants foot traffic. Perhaps a good way to drive foot traffic could be set up an in-store recycling program and tell people to bring in whatever it may be, balloons to a party store or coffee capsules to this place, whatever it is, right? For a brand, maybe having a recycling solution on a challenging to recycle waste stream could drive love and market share. And these are other ways to sort of tease out value beyond what is the aluminum worth or the plastic worth or those sort of things. And this helps unlock the ability to solve things where like just the fundamental business equation doesn't make sense. And the final thing I'll say on this is COVID and post COVID is not making this any better because what sets material value, especially in the world of packaging, which is mostly plastics or polymers is the price of oil. And oil has been on a steady decrease for the past 10 years and COVID has really shot it down and will likely stay there for a while, which will make the business equation of recycling even more challenging. Absolutely. And what else do you think has changed based on this pandemic? I mean, I've seen behaviors changing and policies changing in terms of health and safety related to not being able to bring your reusable shopping bag to the grocery store or reusable cups and mugs at coffee shops. Um, have you seen any changes or things even beyond the price of oil that you think are going to have longer lasting impacts on programs that you're working on? Absolutely. So I'm going to start with the positive because there's also a lot of negative. So what's the positive out of COVID is that our impact on the environment, and when I say our, like people's impact, humanity's impact on the environment is becoming much more clear. And you can only become clear when you sort of disengage a little bit and you see what is the world like where we take a big step back. And what have we seen? We've seen emission levels go down. We've seen carbon emissions go down. Um, this has been already in well-documented articles, which I am certain will be followed by scientific reports. And I'm, you know, everyone's seen this, so I won't give too many examples. 
that's objective, but we're also seeing emotional reinforcement where animals are showing up where they haven't shown up before, like humpback whales off the coast of Montreal and jellyfish in the canals of Venice, and it just goes on. So these two things should only create tailwind for the environmental movement. Um, and that's good for everything out there uh, from organic farming to fair trade to recycling to reuse. It should only give tailwind to all things good and awesome, right, as it pertains to eco and environment. That's the good news. Some more challenging news is recycling as an industry is really taking well, a proverbial punch in the face. And that's all driven because of low oil prices. Recycling has been decreasing effectively in capability for the past decade for three reasons. One is low oil, because uh, oil's already oil's already been low er, even before COVID. This is just making it even worse. Um, also because uh, end markets have stopped uh, importing waste. Now, China, India, Southeast Asia stopped importing waste for good reasons. But for local recyclers in Western Europe, North America, uh, 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 Australia and other places, it simply means half of the market has disappeared. That's tough. Imagine if half your retailers disappeared if you were a product brand. That's not a happy day. And then the third is the quality of our waste is actually becoming worse because as packaging becomes lighter, in the eyes of a recycler, that means less available material per package you deal with. So. And COVID is only uh, uh, heightening that issue, let's say. Now, if you move over, because you asked about reuse, reuse is interesting because you could argue the tailwind to the environmental movement is good for reuse. You could also argue that if recycling is less capable, that's good for reuse because people look for alternatives to live a more circular life. Those are good things for reuse. But within reuse, reuse is sort of bifurcated into good news and bad news. So any reusable um, uh, system relies on having a durable container. That's like a truism. But the real question is how is that container refilled? So there's one type of reuse which we would call uh, consumer driven, where the consumer goes to say a supermarket and goes to a bulk dispensing aisle and takes out the cashews or the gummy bears and puts them in their own container and, and, uh, and checks it out. That's a very common practice. Consumer driven reuse, just like taking your coffee shop, a coffee mug to a barista and giving it to the barista or your reusable shopping bag is deeply challenged during COVID because of health and safety concerns, because we can't trust a consumer cleaning. No matter who it is, we just can't trust it, rightly so. And what I've seen is Large uh, retailers have paused a lot of those services, just like Starbucks pausing reusable cups and you know those sort of things. And the question is, how quickly will it come back? And that's unknown. And I think there you're seeing a lot of challenges. On something like what we do at Loop, what I would call professional uh, reuse, um, where the cleaning is done not by the consumer, but by a professional system, and the filling is done by the actual manufacturer, that's not just loop, but could be beer in Canada, beverages in Germany, and many other such systems. There, it's actually surged. Um, uh, and what it really shows us is that reuse is differentiated by how it's cleaned. You know, a good example of this is we've all sat in dental chairs, at least many of us, and you know, once a year we get our dental cleaning. And the tools the dentist cleans our mouth with have probably been in many mouths before, some potentially highly diseased mouths too, because they're all you know clean. And does anyone ever think about this? And probably not because the dentist, we trust the dentist has professionally sterilized those tools. So what it's showing us is that it depends on the system that's cleaning. And then there is the hybrid model that's been sort of unaffected by COVID where you keep the reusable container at home, but you buy a refill at the store or online, like concentrate or a, a refill sachet. That sort of reusability and disposability mashed together into a hybrid model. So it sort of goes both ways, let's say. Yeah. And if if that's the case, that this model still seems viable, especially from a commercial perspective, if it's not the consumer who's in charge of cleaning or sterilization, what would you say is a business case for companies in the natural products industry and beyond? To follow up on this, should we still be investing and putting resources into these solutions right now, even if cash is a concern or we're we're, stre we're stretched and strapped on different resources? Yeah. Um, do you do you have anything that you would say Gosh. to brands and retailers and suppliers yeah. right now? Yeah, I would say uh, there's a couple of really interesting things that you mentioned in, in your question. So first, I would say resilience is the most important thing. And I would ensure, just like we right now individually focus on our health and safety, a, a especially natural product companies need to exist for the world to be a good place. And everything should be focused around preserving longevity. So if cash is tight, 
focus on cash and only cash, right? Put everything off that was discretionary and really focus on being alive, especially through COVID, but then also through the likely, you know, global recession that we're about to, to embark on. I mean, frankly, we're already in it. We just maybe haven't fully realized because everyone's hoping it's going to come back to normal, but the normal will be a depressed economy. There's just no question. So please, please focus on resilience before any innovations, because wouldn't it be a shame if important organizations for the planet go away? And I've already seen this in companies that entered COVID with very little cash flow, maybe debt, maybe different things. And uh, I'm thankful, for example, TerraCycle entered it, you know, uh, in a very healthy position. And that's why we're able to be around and preserve people's jobs. So resilience, resilience, resilience. Now, if you have room, and that's a big if, for innovation. You know, it's it's people have talked uh, about these dichotomies about, okay, if people are so focused on health and safety, is there, you know, and we're so focused on plastic and single use, is the idea of reuse and recycling dead or are we going to stop caring about the environment? And I think during COVID, what is shown is you can do both things. You can vote for things that you perceive as health and safety, which is a lot of overpackaging and disposable goods, while still being pissed off about the waste issue. Those two things can be true simultaneously. Coming out of COVID, people are saying, well, well, people who are now more financially strapped because of a recession uh, that, that, that we're in, are they going to just go back to basics? And again, because sustainability is many times seen as a premium, just like organic, fair trade, or very many times seen as a premium, will we stop caring? And I think we can be more cash strapped and still care more about the environment simultaneously. So these two things that may seem disconnected or opposite forces can be true at the very same time. And so what I think that means is it's important to think about continuing to invest as long as you have the financial wherewithal to do so, really reinforcing resilience in these uh, overall ideas. And in closing, what I would say is in looking at organizations, and we work with you know many, many, many consumer product companies and retailers, what is coming out to me is a great truth. The companies that really did care about sustainability are reinforcing it and continuing to lean in. But many companies that were just giving sustainability lip service and were sort of call it by social contract, compelled to be a part of it, are now leaning back. And this is a great opportunity for those who are really authentic to it to differentiate versus everyone sort of doing the same thing and you can't tell who's authentic versus, you know, just doing it because they sort of felt like they had to. Absolutely. I completely agree. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and thanks Tom for sharing your perspectives today. If you enjoyed this interview and would like to hear more from Tom Zaki, CEO of TerraCycle, please join us for his upcoming keynote presentation at Natural Products Expo East this fall. And make sure you're also subscribed to our New Hope Network YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you so much.